we don't believe that you are here by accident. And we mean that. We believe that God has you here for a reason. You might be here because somebody extended an invitation. Somebody put a door hanger on your, on your door or because someone gave you an invite card or maybe you saw something on social media. But I just want you to know that, that we don't believe you're here by accident. And, and we really do believe that church is a family. And so it's an honor that you would get to see what our crazy little family is like here. Make sure you fill out that Connect card and turn that in because we'd love to meet you and get those, um, uh, those little red tickets so you can exchange them at Scoop Dogs for some free hot dogs and ice cream and all that fun stuff. So I know I'm, I'm standing in between uh, food and you, so I'm just going to get right to it. Um, we are here for, uh, we're starting this Sunday a two-week series called Tough Questions. And so this is part one today. If you want to see part two, you need to come back next week. Um, but I don't, I don't know about you. For, for myself, I, I grew up in church, and I had a wonderful church and a wonderful church family and great people in my life. But as, as most people do at a certain age, you start to ask hard questions. You start to ask hard questions about your faith. And, and, and sometimes the questions that we do have, uh, particularly around our faith, um, sometimes they're easy, right? Like, was, was Jesus a blue-eyed white guy? No, he wasn't, right? Like, he, he was Middle Eastern. But then sometimes we, we come to a, a time in our life where we start asking questions that are a little bit more difficult to, to answer. Why does God allow so much pain in the world? How come when I prayed for somebody to get well, they, they never did? And we start saying, why? Why, God? And, and the, sad, the sad reality this isn't true across the board, but in a lot of churches, sometimes the very place that should have been the safest place to ask these questions isn't. Sometimes when we have those questions, we feel like, well, I can't ask people in my church because I might get judged. But we know that they're there. And so this, this series is to recognize that, 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 that not only do we recognize that there are tough questions, that sometimes like a pebble in our shoe, they stick around and they just gnaw away at our soul, and then like a pressure cooker, they sort of explode at some point, And sometimes that puts our faith in crisis or maybe leads some to leave the faith entirely. But, but not only do, do we have those questions, but also we need to be able to have a place in an environment and a community where we can engage and wrestle with those tough questions. Because the truth is that God is not afraid of your hard questions. In fact, we're, we're going to look at today how Jesus actually encourages us to examine the foundations of our belief. Now, in our, in our current culture, uh, there, there's actually been a, a movement of people uh, who leave the faith. That, that happens every year. In fact, you know, tens of thousands of people come to know Jesus every year, praise the Lord. But, but at the same time, every year, tens of thousands of people also walk away from their faith. On social media, they're sometimes called ex-evangelicals. Maybe you've heard of that. Or sometimes they're more often called deconstructionists or deconstructing Christians. And the idea is because they, they're sort of taking apart those elements of their faith. And, and you might be here this morning and you say, yeah, that sort of describes me. I, I grew up with a lot of kind of cute sayings, cutesy sayings and platitudes about Jesus, and now I'm just not sure anymore. I want you to know that this series is for you. And if you have somebody in your life that is doing the same thing and you're not sure how to, to address it or how to help walk with them through that, I want you to know that this series is for you. So again, we're, we're gonna do this in two parts. And you know, hey, if you want more, uh, we, we can do this. We can, we can extend the series. You know, we're, we're flexible like that. Uh, but today we're, we're gonna be looking at specifically what Jesus has to say about, about examining our faith, about examining the foundations of what we believe and why we believe it. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to start with a very familiar story uh, found in Matthew chapter 7. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to it or you can open and flip the pages there. If you don't, don't worry. The words are going to be up here on the screen for you to read along. And if you would like a Bible, see myself, see somebody in a green shirt, somebody who looks like they know what they're doing. And uh, we'd love to give you a Bible just so you can take God's word with you wherever you go. So we're going to look at what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. And we're going to look at how Jesus actually encouraged us to examine what we believe and why we believe it. So this is what Jesus says. Verse 24, Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now the rain came down and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Now the rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, for some of you, this might be a familiar story. Maybe for others, it's not, and that's okay. Some of you might have even learned a little song that goes along with, with this in, uh, in Sunday school. But let, let's, let's consider the context for, for a minute before we start asking how it applies to us. Context always matters when we come to Scripture. Um, so fortunately for this, this is actually not that hard to relate to our own time. You see, in Palestine, that was, it's a very sandy place. All around Jerusalem and in Galilee, there's a bunch of sand. There is some vegetation, but... There's a lot of dirt and sand, and the reality is sometimes when you're walking on top of that sand, it can be packed down that it feels pretty solid. And so Jesus is speaking to something that that most builders would have understood, that when you're building a house, you need to be extra careful that what you're building on has a solid rock foundation underneath it, and it's not just a bunch of packed down compressed sand. Because what will happen is, is it rains in Palestine. And so what would happen is, is when those rains came, it could wash away and it could shake up that dirt pretty quickly. And so it might not happen overnight. It might be a week or two weeks or even a year from then. But gradually that dirt would be eroded. And if a part of your house was built on the sand, then it would collapse. All right, so he, very, very, very um, understandable. But he's not just talking about good building practices. And, and in fact, what he's encouraging us to do is taking that principle and applying it spiritually. And really, got, I got a couple of points for you. So if you're just taking notes, this would be the first one to take down. And this is what I think Jesus is saying. Jesus wants you to inspect the foundations of your faith. Jesus wants you to inspect the foundations of your faith because when the metaphorical storms of life come, you want to make sure that what you believe is on a firm foundation because we know that life life will knock us down. Life will kick us when we're down. Life will chew us up and spit us out. And you might be in a moment where you feel like life is doing that to you. And if not, you can probably think back to a time where it has done that. And so... so that's, that's true. We don't need to be convinced of that, that life is hard. It's sometimes harder for others than it is for, for some of us. But, but life is hard regardless of who you are. And so Jesus is saying, listen, the storms of life are going to come. What's important is the life that you've built for yourself. Is it built on a solid foundation or is it built on the sands? Now, I'm, I'm using faith broadly here. Uh, because really, faith is something that you trust in, something that you believe to be true. So whether you're agnostic or atheist or Buddhist or a Christian, at some level, we all have faith. We all have a faith. We all make assumptions about the world. None of us have it all figured out. None of us have all the answers to all of life's questions. And so this, this challenge isn't just for Christians. It's not just for the Jewish people he was, Jesus was talking to. It's for all of us. That regardless of what your worldview is, regardless of what mine is, Jesus is saying, listen, you better make sure that it is built on something sturdy. Because if not, again, when life comes to knock us down, it'll really be put to the the test. And if it's not built on a solid rock, we're going to be left wanting. It reminds me, earlier this month, um, I had finished the book, reading the book, All Quiet on the Western Front. Any of you read that? A few of y'all, yeah. So uh, typically, a lot of people read it in high school. I never did, but I heard it was a good book. And it was written actually by somebody, I believe it was in 1928, 10 years after the end of World War I. And it was written by a soldier who had been in that war. And so it's, it's a fictional story. It's sort of historical fiction, but it's reflecting his own experience, if that makes sense. And, and in the very first chapter of the book, um, the, the story is about a group of friends who, who sign up you know, with, with enthusiastic fervor to fight in World War I. They want to fight for their country. Uh, you know, There's all this propaganda talking about the glory of battle. When they, go to, when they went to school, their teachers were telling them. They were sort of creating this romantic vision of, of, of what a, a war would be like and the glory that could be theirs. But what the author says in speaking through the main character is that when their first taste of battle came, all of that romantic vision of what battle would be like went right out 
the window. In fact, I want to read you a quote from the book, and it'll be up here on the screen. This is, this is what the, um, the main character, Paul, but again, the author sort of speaking through Paul, says. <clears throat> the character says, For us lads of 18, our teachers ought to have been mediators and guides to the world of maturity. But the first death we saw shattered this belief. The first bombardment showed us our mistake, and under it, the world, as they had taught it to us, broke in pieces. In other words, what he's saying is this vision of the world, which seemed so sound when that first bomb came, it shattered it all, and they realized that the world did not look the same way as they thought it had. And I share that because oftentimes in a similar way that can happen to us with our faith is we can be taught these nice, again, cute platitudes, but then when life comes to knock us down, suddenly we realize, wait a second, life is a little bit more complicated than I thought it was. I had this, uh, this sort of experience when I was transitioning from high school to college, pretty typical, um, right, but um, I had been really involved in my church when I was in high school and felt God moving powerfully in my life, and, and you know, I was just excited for what the Lord was doing. And then I, I started to, to have these, these questions. I started to ask myself these tough questions, and, and, I, and I didn't have any good answers for them. You know, I thought of myself as pretty spiritually mature, and you know, I didn't feel like I was a dummy, but I, I couldn't come up with satisfactory answers. And not only that, but that was during a season in my life where I didn't feel the emotional presence of God, that emotional presence that I often associated with God. Um, I didn't feel that in the same way. You know, I didn't get those goosebumps on my back when they played my favorite worship song, or you know, I didn't get those warm and fuzzy feelings like I used to. And so I, I started to ask the questions. I said, well, you know, is there something wrong with me? Or maybe is there something wrong with God? Now that led me on probably a year or two um, journey, sort of exploring what do I believe and why do I believe it? What is the firm foundation that I'm, a, that I'm building my life on? And what was encouraging to me and what is encouraging to me is that Jesus doesn't ask us to sweep those questions or sweep those doubts under the rug. Like, that's what I love, is is sometimes there's so much shame that we can create on ourselves when when we don't know the answer. And and, and we're asking these hard questions like, well, shouldn't I be, shouldn't I be better, right? Is God disappointed in me because I'm having doubts? And we, we start wrestling with that. But what I love is that Jesus is saying, no, listen, it is good. Inspect the foundations because when life comes, gosh, you want to make sure it's solid. And so for you, if if you are in that season of asking tough questions, or maybe if there's somebody in your life who is asking those tough questions, don't be afraid. God's not afraid of your questions. God isn't afraid of their questions. In fact, it is good for us to ask the hard questions about what we believe and why we do, because I believe and what I have come to believe is that the teachings of Jesus and the teachings in his word is a solid foundation on which we can build our life. I firmly believe that. And if you want to know more of why I believe that, let's, let's get a cup of coffee because I'd love to talk to you about it. But Jesus is, is, again, asking us to inspect the foundations of our faith. But, again, we can't just stop there. See, that's part of the problem is in, in, a, in a deconstructing movement, sometimes people are so focused, and honestly, they're a little jaded and bitter in their heart, that when they start tearing down the, these old belief systems, they never really build anything in their place. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. If you live in Garner, there's a, I think it used to be a bank, but there's a building uh, sort of off of Highway 70, and, and, and they tore it down. And, and right now it's in rubble. Like I was driving down the road the other day and they had these big bulldozers that were lifting all this junk and, and putting it into big bins that they're going to haul away. There's a deconstructing of that building. But what would be silly is if they never built anything in, the, in its place, if it was just a pile of dirt forever, right? And so you can't really, it's foolish to have deconstruction if you don't also have reconstruction, And so, again, Jesus is saying, listen, yes, inspect the foundation, but you don't just stop at the inspection. You inspect it so that you can build a life on it. Again, in verse 24, he says, Therefore, 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Again, he's saying if we, if we listen to his words and we put them into practice, we don't just check a box or take a test and get an A+, plus, but we live by them. We incorporate them into our heart and into our lives. He's saying it's like building a house on the rock. Again, as such, there can be no deconstruction, no good healthy deconstruction without also having healthy reconstruction. And it all starts by coming back to Jesus. Right? Like, like that's, the, that's the central focal point of our faith is Jesus. Now, of course, there's other things um, associated with that, but really the central um, tenet, the thing that we cling to is not tradition. It's not a political party. It's not even some sort of strange doctrine. It's Jesus. And, and the Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, understood that. Let me just read you a couple verses from his letter to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, Paul said this about Jesus. Speaking about Jesus, he said, If Christ has not been raised, right? So if he was not uh, uh, who he said he was, if he was not raised, he says, Your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ, and another way to say died, but those who have, who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone else. In other words, Paul is saying, listen, if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, this is all for naught. In fact, we ought to be more pitied than anyone else. Christians ought to be more pitied because Jesus doesn't ask us to go 50% in. He asks us to go all in. And so if we are going all in on this man and he's not who he said he was, we're more to be pitied, Paul says, than anyone else in the world. And so this is the second thing. This is the second point. That the foundation of Christianity is a man who lived, died, and rose from the grave named Jesus. And if you are exploring and you are considering the message of Christ, and if you are in a season of deconstructing and you're, you're, you're trying to figure out what to toss out, what to keep, and what do I put back together, listen, here's what I want you to start with. Is I want you to start with this, a man named Jesus. So it comes back to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, who he was and what he taught. Because if that's not our starting point, nothing else really matters. It's only because of Jesus that any of the peripheral things that we argue about and we debate and we read books and, you know, it's only because of Jesus that any of that really matters. So that's not to downplay, again, these other issues that are worth talking about and debating and thinking but again, if we're not solid on who Jesus is and who he is in our life, and if we're not putting what he says into practice, everything else doesn't matter, All right? That's, the, that's A in the alphabet. Sometimes we want to jump to D or E. That's A. It's Jesus. I heard um, someone tell a story a few weeks ago. <clears throat> they were talking about the importance of sort of anchoring ourselves in Christ. And um, he was telling a story about uh, a, a day that him and his friend went fishing, and, and then they loved to fish. And so they got out on a boat and I think it was just a really big lake where they were at. And so they went out and they fished all day, caught some fish, had a really good time, but they wanted to sleep on the lake. So they had a little boat and um, what they did was they, they dropped anchor somewhere and, and then, you know, set up their pillows, maybe put something, to, a net to keep the mosquitoes out and they went to sleep. Well, when they woke up, they realized that they weren't where they had left off. Like when they woke up and they looked around, it was an entirely different part of the lake than where they had. They had to sort of get their wits about them. And, and what had happened was they had actually forgotten to put down the anchor like they had intended to. And so almost imperceptibly, slowly throughout the night, this little drift happened and it got farther and farther and farther away until they woke up and they had no clue where they were, at least for the moment. And the truth is, is that that can happen in our faith. You see, if we are not anchored in Christ, when the opinions or the pain of life come, the opinions of others or the pain of this world, when they come to us, we begin to slowly drift and drift and drift. You see, most people don't wake up one morning and say, ah, I don't really get this whole Jesus thing. Or ah, Jesus isn't the only way. 
to have a relationship with God. Like that stuff usually doesn't just happen overnight. It's those imperceptible slow drifts where we find ourselves further and further from God without even really realizing it. And I believe that often happens because we get away from our anchor, the anchor of our faith, who Jesus is, a man who was born, lived, and died for your sins and for mine, was rose, uh, risen from the grave. So in, in the few minutes that we have left, I, I just want to say, where do we go from here? All right, so, so maybe you're sort of on board with that and you're thinking like, okay, that describes me, that describes somebody I know, but what, where do I go from here? Well, let, me, let me give you a few steps, okay? So one, like I said, come back for part two, okay? And if we need a part three, if we need a part four, we can do that, okay? But come back next week. If it struck a chord in you, now we might not have a, a bounce house next week. We might not have a fire truck, but we got good coffee, We've got a, a nice uh, room, air-conditioned building, and we've got people who would be thrilled to see you. Second thing is if you are in the process of deconstructing your faith, then, then I want you to know that I am glad you care enough about your faith to ask the hard questions. Because I believe apathy is more dangerous than doubt. Apathy in our faith is more dangerous because well, we're, we're in this study. We took a pause for this, but we're going through the study in the gospel of Mark. And, and so we'll jump back into it in a few weeks. But one of the things that, that I think um, really struck a chord in me is how when I saw the people that were interacting with Jesus and who Jesus interacted with, the ones that he sort of gave a hand to were the people that came to him basically just to, to get one over on him, who, who didn't really want to hear what Jesus had to say. They were just trying to get him into a trap. Often that was religious leaders. Sometimes that was ordinary people who they just wanted something for Je from Jesus. They didn't really care about what he had to say. They, they just wanted him to multiply bread. They're like, do another trick, Jesus. And those were the people that he tended not to engage with as much, but the people he did were those who leaned in. And, and if you look at the, the type of people who leaned in, they weren't people who had it all together. I mean, they were people with sick. They were people who doubted. We, we looked at a story a couple of weeks ago about, about a man who Jesus wanted to, to heal his son. And he says, anything's possible for him who believes. And the man says, well, I believe Jesus, but help my unbelief. Like, I think I believe, I, I, I wanna believe, but I'm struggling to believe. And what I love about that story is Jesus then heals the boy, not because the man had perfect faith, but because he was leaning in. He said, Jesus, I'm trying. And that's the thing. Again, if you're wrestling with your faith, the what encourages me about that is that you are leaning in. It's when we have the pebble in our shoe and we don't do anything about it. And we just live life sort of apathetic to our beliefs that I think the real poison sets in. So again, if that is you and you're, and you're leaning in, I think God honors that. So what you can do, one of the things, uh, just resources. Again, we'd love to sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and chat and we can talk about whatever. We can talk about theology. We can talk about the historicity of the resurrection or philosophy or whatever. Um, but one of the places I want to just to get you started is on that um, connect card, on the back of it, there's a QR code. So you can scan that. And there's several things. So if you scan that, you can fill out a prayer request. You can do all sorts of stuff. But one of the things on there is there's a resource list. And it's just a simple document. And on it, it has some books and videos um, curated for you that hopefully will give you a place to start. Sometimes, especially when we're deconstructing our faith, again, we, we listen to the people who sort of have a bone to pick with the church or a bone to pick with Jesus. And so I wanna just provide some, a counterbalance to maybe some of the things that you're listening to and hearing. And so I, on that, that sheet, there are some books of people who have wrestled with it, who have gone through the struggle of asking tough questions about their faith and still have come out anchored in Christ. There's also some videos you can watch of some great interviews of people who have done the same. And so again, that's just a resource for, for some of you. It might be two of you in here who actually do it. It doesn't matter to me, but it's there. So hang on to that Connect card, scan it, and, and you can download that and access the books and um, uh, videos and all that stuff. And again, if you wanna talk with myself or somebody, make a note on that Connect card uh, and we'll pick a time and place and. We'll, uh, we'll hash it out. It'll be fun. And lastly, the last thing is I want to encourage you and, and, and really it just all of us, whether or not you're wrestling with your faith or not, but just to look at Jesus again with fresh eyes. 
I think that's something that so often happens in the church and so often happens in my own life is my eyes become stale to Jesus, take the gospel for granted. And in the moments where God sort of washes the haze from my eyes and my heart and allows me to see him again for who he really is, not just for all the stuff I, I want him to be, or the stuff I've put on him, but like when he helps me to see with HD, suddenly I am blown away. And I realize just just how much I've taken for granted, or, you know, just how much I've, just how much I I maybe have ignored what he wants to do in my life. And so my encouragement to you is to see Jesus again with fresh eyes. Ask him. The Bible says, seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And so seek him. Say, God, I want to see you again. I want to see you. Open my eyes. And again, I believe God will honor that. It may not happen like a lightning bolt moment, but I believe God will honor that. And again, my hope is that you will see Jesus as a God who hated sin, but cared enough about you and me to die for our sins not because we were good enough, not because he owed us one, but because he loves you and he loves us. And he wants more for you than anything that you might want for yourself. So if you wanna know more, I hope you'll uh, make a note on a connect card. I hope you'll come back next week. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we are so humbled at your relentless love. Your relentless love, God, the the, the love that chases us down, the the love that never gives up. A love that would, would cause you to come from heaven to die on a cross for people that wanted nothing to do with you. Lord, we thank you for that, God. And, and I thank you that you are not afraid of our questions, Lord, that you are not afraid of... Uh, <laughs> of the feelings we might have, the things that we don't share with others, the things we don't talk about at parties or talk about with friends, the things we keep caged up. God, you see those and you know those and you aren't afraid of those. And so Lord, for those who are wrestling with their faith or or maybe just wrestling with whether or not you are who you say you are. Maybe maybe there's been pain. Maybe there's been um, abuse from someone who called themselves a Christian. Maybe there was church hurt. Maybe there were prayers that felt like they went by unanswered. Lord, I pray that you would show themselves or show yourself to them afresh again. Lord, that you would show them your love and your grace and your goodness and you would lead them to your truth. Lord, for those of us who are walking with you, but God, maybe we just need a refresh. Maybe we need our eyes and our hearts cleaned so we can see you with fresh eyes and a fresh heart. Lord, I pray that you would do that. God, we love you and we thank you for first loving us. We thank you for all this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.